Yeah, for me, it was, I think, probably the first time in my career where I was somewhere where the mission was so important, right? I think up till then, I'd always been at companies where I think, frankly, they played at missions. They played at uh, having a, a big why about what we were doing stuff, why we were doing things. Um, but Ionic, I mean, once we really got our head around what we were trying to achieve and what the outcome would be if we did that, there was a very good group of very strong people who were very passionate about trying to solve that problem. So it wasn't a lack of quality. It wasn't a lack of hard work. It was it was a big, big thing. You know, and when I look back and, and think about that, I think the work, the work that you did and Steve and Adam did about creating the right sort of culture for getting passionate people on board to try and go and solve a big problem was was very impressive. Um, the other thing, Mike, that was very impressive was, you know, without naming names, we built up a uh, very, very uh, high quality community of design partners, early adopters. And it wasn't by accident, right? You, you put together a program that uh, was much more than just, you know, give us some feedback once in a while. There was a lot more to that and how we engage with them as well. We learned a lot. Um, why don't you just kind of explain what, what, what you did and, and how that came around? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I think anytime, anytime you're starting in a new company, every, every company's dynamics are going to be different and, and their, and your go to market is going to be a little bit different. And, Kind of going back to what what I said when I sat down with uh, with um, Adam and with Steve and you know uh, another gentleman Jeff Sizemore was critical kind of in the evolution of of, of Ionic uh, Brian Gilson so these uh, great minds really skilled technologists and um, we were kind of looking at it saying there's a couple approaches you could try to go you know kind of more medium sized small companies and try to figure out. Um, how do we get enough kind of mass with those organizations? And then we kind of kind of, you know, go, go up to the larger enterprises. As I said earlier, what we what we recognized was to affect the ecosystems we needed to, we had to go land the largest companies in the world um, that had enough spend with those, with those cloud ecosystems, the AWS's and the Google's and the, and the Azure's that, um, that, that they would potentially take notice. Um, you know, we, we didn't have, we, we wanted to try to get their attention quickly. And so um, to do that, that means, that means that meant that we actually had to go back and say, how do we structure a program where we can go land the biggest, most complicated, complex brands in the world um, as our early adopters, as our first customers in? And that's typically inverted. Most companies don't do that. They aspire to get those guys over time. They don't start there. And so to start there, we actually changed our selling motion. Uh, the selling motion was a lot less about let us tell you about what we do, what problems we solve. It was a lot more around the philosophical holy grail that you described um, and we talked about, which is, do we believe the person sitting across from us um, believes that if we were able to solve this problem, it would be it would be a game changer. It would be material. It would change the industry. And how do we go find those people? Um, and so we actually started the this early adopter program was actually philosophically qualifying in uh, really two attributes, which is, um, does the person, and we were targeting chief information security officers. So they were the visionaries and the owners of the information security visions within these big organizations. Did they actually philosophically believe that that cybersecurity starts with data out? And that if you could actually go in and 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 the holy grail of data was making data aware, that data could have policy that could follow it, you know, did they believe that if you were able to do that and you were able to do that successfully, that that would be a game changer? And that was that was the holy grail. And I would say the same thing was was uh, was accurate for the investors that we brought in. You know, did they believe that solving this problem would be game changing? It would be a multi billion, you know, tens of billion dollar kind of idea. And so, what we did is we basically profiled and we started looking for. Hey, who are the innovators in the marketplace? Uh, who are the movers and shakers? Who are the CISOs? Who are such big thinkers? And we um, luckily had some great tier one VCs uh, backing us and, and they already had established some great rapport with a lot of these innovators. And so uh, it was really connecting the philosophy of if we were able to solve this, what would it mean for you? And the second one is, do you work at an organization that has an appetite to, in, to take risk on technology early in its maturation if it has the potential to actually be a leapfrog for you or, or game changing? And so we were, we, were, we were philosophically qualifying the person, 
And then we were also philosophically qualifying the organization and their appetite um, to spend money. Um, and what's interesting, um, Andrew, is you know we we designed the program to say to to really get involved in this. We weren't talking about tens of thousands of dollars, a hundred thousands of dollars. These organizations were investing millions of dollars with us to go on a journey because they were so passionate about the 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 problem we were solving. And so you you mentioned we built this amazing community. We did. We built a community where we had very very passionate customers, very very passionate partners, investors. Um, all getting together, collaborating, saying, if we could, if we could, if we could go uh, crack this, this is going to be game changing. And so, you know, our, our ask for these, uh, these uh, customers uh, was kind of counterintuitive. You would actually think a design partner would be like, hey, please work with us. It was no, there's only a handful of organizations in the world that probably have the, the cojones, the balls to actually jump in with the technology of our, of our um, uh, maturity to go solve this problem. And that may or may not be you. And it was really interesting because the true innovators came forward. And by the way, it's going to be a multi-million dollar investment to kind of partner with us. And the value is going to come actually kind of later in the journey versus the very beginning of the journey. But you're going to be influencing that journey. Um, and what we what I found was there were incredible innovators that saw the potential and actually stepped in. And they did very unnatural things in their procurement processes, et cetera, because we were so early um, to actually partner with us to, to, to go solve the problem. And I think the only reason we were able to do that, Andrew, is because the problem was such a big, hairy, audacious goal problem that, that they, they genuinely wanted to kind of see us succeed. Yeah, this was not a slightly better web gateway or a different way to do endpoint, right? It was, it was completely different. And I, I remember... Two things that I was really surprised about early on when you know I was thinking about joining. One was that um, that these people would spend millions of dollars to be part of this, right? I was I was shocked, right? That uh, that was you know I don't, I don't know if commonplace, but it, you know this was not out of the ordinary for them to do that. They would look for really game changing security technologies and want to be part of the ecosystem that brought them to market. Right. So I was I was surprised about that. And then secondly, the thing that was eye-opening to me was how many CISOs that we talked to were very, very candid about A, their willingness to uh, take on the risk, but also the company appetite for doing it. Right. You know, I remember having conversations with CISOs where they would be really pretty excited about the, the whole idea, but then would take themselves out by saying, look, I I'm not a point in my career where I can take this on. We're not a point in the program where it makes sense to do this. Or they would just say, yeah, it doesn't matter what I want. The company's never going to buy, you know, this sort of stuff from a, a startup like you guys, right? And they would uh, select out at that point. It was really eye-opening for me that that would happen. Yeah, I think, Andrew, to your point, we did that very, very early in the conversations. We didn't we didn't try to kind of delay this. This was first, second conversation is – um, is qualifying that in because there's only the only thing that we can control is our time and, and the time we were spending with some someone on their side. We don't want to waste their time or our time. And so we had, you know, and I know this is a shock for a lot of people that got into the program uh, with us and started kind of from a selling motion. We had those conversations very early. And I, and I, and I think organizations were very appreciative that we, we were having this very candid, open conversation uh, versus trying to subtly position kind of these things no, it was very direct. And if they weren't, if if the timing wasn't right for them, that was okay. It wasn't. It was a. It was a. It was a humble okay, saying that's great. And it, it isn't right for a lot of organizations. And a lot of organizations needed to be more mature or more proven, etc. Um, and you know, and you know, it was very much a hey, we appreciate that. 